Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, December 2nd. Our topic today is accessible digital content for everyone. Our special guest is Stephen Anderson. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula, who will introduce Stephen and ask him the newbie question. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on um, <clears throat> Classroom 2.0 Live this morning. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Stephen to our audience. As a former classroom teacher and director of instructional technology, Stephen is highly sought after for his expertise in um, technology integration and using social media for learning. As at Web20 Classroom on Twitter, he regularly travels the country talking to schools and districts about the use of social media in the classroom and how they can better serve students through technology. Stephen has been a presenter and keynoter at several national and international educational conferences, including ISD, ASCD, FETC, WISE, VSTE, as well as numerous state and local conferences. He is the author of three books, The Relevant Ed Educator, How Connectedness Empowers Learning, which he co-authored with his very good friend and social media maven, Tom Whitby. He's also written The Tech Savvy Administrator, part of the ASCD um, series, and he's also the author of Content Curation, How to Avoid Information Overload, which is part of the Corwin Connected Educators series. He is also responsible for helping create the granddaddy of them all, EdChat, a weekly educational discussion on Twitter that boasts over 500 weekly participants. Stephen has been recognized with the 2009 and 2011 EduBlogs, the Twitterer of the Year Award, a Top 50 Educational Innovator Award from the Center for Digital Education, a Microsoft Heroes of Education Award, along with the 2003 BAMI Award, which are the Educational Emmys for his work with EdChat. Stephen is a great friend of mine who I met Originally, I believe it was at the ISTE in Denver in 2000, I don't remember the year, where several of us shared a cabin a few days before the convention, the ISTE convention started, and we just had lots of fun and geeked out all over the place. And I usually get to see Stephen every, at least once a year at the ISTE conferences. So without further ado, Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you. For you to answer this newbie question, okay, what does accessible digital content mean and why is it important for teachers to understand? So before I answer that question, Paula, you are a sweetheart. Um, thank you for, for that wonderful introduction of me. And, uh, and it's so, it's awesome to be here to, um, to talk about this because I realize that um, accessibility, I tell people all the time, is not the most sexiest thing to talk about, but we're, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's so critically important um, for us to have this discussion. And, um, and, and it really all does come down to this question about what does accessible digital content mean? And um, I, I'm going to tackle that throughout our conversation today, but I think more importantly, it's, it's important for us to understand because it is something that, that we're all responsible for. You know, if we think about what we teach in the classroom, you know, we, we want to make sure that we reach every student equally and, um, and not just the, the content that we, that we provide for students, but for our communities as well. We don't want to leave anyone out. And so a lot of times accessibility is an afterthought until, uh, until an issue is raised or, or there's a problem um, in, the, in the classroom or in the district, and then we have to scramble to, to figure out alternatives or, um, or, or op 
options to, to make content or, or to make what we present accessible. And it should be something that we are constantly thinking about. And it's not, accessibility isn't something that is very hard to do. It's not something that uh, will take a lot of time, but it is something that's that's very important. And, and we're going to tackle kind of these two, you know, these two these two questions about what does it mean and uh, and why is it important to understand. So um, I, I don't really I can't add anything to that wonderful introduction that that Paula gave um, for us. But uh, you can you can reach out to me on Twitter um, as we you know as we go through today. I encourage you to use the hashtag um, you know hashtag Alive Class Two Zero. And, uh, and, and tweet your thoughts and tell the world what you're sharing and learning. You can also read my blog and, uh, and check out those things. I will also preface, uh, preface what we're going to talk about today with two things. One, um, anybody who knows me, I am not a lawyer, um, nor do I play one on TV. So um, it's important to know that there are different rules uh, everywhere that govern um, what you have to do when it comes to accessibility and what you're, uh, what you're supposed to do when it comes to accessibility. So make sure that you, uh, that you understand those rules and, uh, with, uh, with, with accessibility. And the other thing too is I know there's a lot of people who are joining us from the U, from, from outside of the U.S., which is, which is amazing. That's what, uh, that's what technology enables us to do is learn from every, every corner in the world. And, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today centers around um, some of the some of the the, the rules around what ha what has to happen in the U.S. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't take what um, what's good best practices and apply them to other places. Um, like uh, there was uh, there were so many countries in there I couldn't even I couldn't even keep up with them. So to so keep those two things in mind that um, that that you you it's important for everybody to understand you know what what's what's what are the rules in your area and then uh, and then uh, making sure that we uh, we level set, and we're all on the same page about that. So, um, so when I when I was creating this deck, which you know, if you saw my comment, I was in. Uh, I spent the week in Connecticut working with school districts in Connecticut. And I actually got on a flight at, at about 5:30 this morning, um, 5:30 a.m. Eastern, um, to get here. I just walked into my home office uh, about 45 minutes ago. But uh, as I was building this deck, I was all excited because I, I've used this slide a lot to talk about accessibility, and there's a really cool. Um, GIF image that goes along with this, and when I when I sent the deck over to Peggy, she was like, "Well, that that GIF's not going to work." When I said, "Well, that's fine, no problem, we'll work around it," and that's kind of uh, that's kind of where where it's a good it's a good way to start when we talk about accessibility is that you know when when we're talking about digital content, we have to make we we have to adapt, we have to come up with perhaps a different way of doing things. So so rather than scurrying to figure out a video or another way to do this. I, I have, I'll just adapt and I'll describe to you, you know, what that what that image is of. So I, I like to start out when I talk about accessibility with this analogy around chopsticks because I love sushi, and um, you know, if I, I just spent some time in Miami and and had one of the best sushi meals I've ever had. If you're ever in if you're ever in Miami, Florida, go to Sushi Garage. It is amazing. Um, but so so I I love to eat sushi. My kids. Um, can't stand it, but they love to they love to eat uh, they love to eat Chinese food and um, and so I love to use chopsticks and so I can uh, I can pick up a pair of chopsticks and I can use them uh, I can use them you know straight out of the package and just and, and go to town using them. My kids, on the other hand, I have a daughter who's uh, who's eight years old, Reagan, and a daughter who's four, Chesney. Um, when they go to use chopsticks, they have a little bit more trouble with it. And so if you've ever been to um, to an Asian restaurant, they might have the the little device that you see. Um, to um, to drop the to, to put the chopsticks in so that it's a little easier for the kids to um, to use those. It's that's that's an accommodation, and, and in the classroom we're used to creating accommodations. We're used to creating accommodations for students um, either in the the way that they access content or the way that they consume content. Uh, we're we're used to making those accommodations. You know, my girls they 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 have you know pretty good motor skills. But what about someone who doesn't have um, who doesn't have the, the the ability to have that fine, those fine motor skills, perhaps due to an injury or uh, to a pre-existing disability? Um, one of the cool things that you can look up, and we'll try, I'll try to send over a link. Maybe we can put this in the live binder too. Is there are there are uh, uh, utensils that um, that folks who have um, a, perhaps something like a Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's disease or cerebral palsy can use to that self level. And that's what this GIF is really cool. Where um, it, it's, it, it shows this person who was struggling eating just a, a simple bowl of cereal, 
um, and someone created a, uh, a utensil that actually self-levels um, continuously as the person is using it. So they can uh, they can eat the they can they can put the spoon in a cereal, and no matter um, how that spoon is moved, it will always self-level and self-correct itself. That's that's a, a deeper part of this uh, a part of this conversation around accessibility and around accommodations, where there are different levels of these accommodations that we have to make in order so that students and our communities can access digital content well, where we're going to have some students and some community members who can who can access the content just, you know, you put it online, you put it out there, and they can consume it just as easily. Some are going to need just a little bit of help, and some are going to need something completely different in order to uh, in order to access that content. So I, I always like to say to people that the, the tools that we use should never be the barrier um, from keeping something, uh, keeping someone from doing something they really want to do. But oftentimes, you know, with the advent of technology, the, tech, the, the tool is the barrier. Um, you know, think about when, um, when radio came out, you know, radio is a, is a pretty simple medium. Um, if you have the ability to hear, if you didn't have the ability to hear, you didn't have, you, you couldn't, you couldn't consume, you know, radio content. Then we moved into uh, into the the era of television and moving pictures. And when when television and and, uh, and movies first came out, um, if you if if you have the capacity to hear uh, and see, you you could you could consume that that medium. You could consume that technology. But what if you were uh, visual impaired? You couldn't. You could still hear, but you couldn't see and uh, and and really consume that media the way it was intended. Technology has helped. Um, you know, the, one of the question, one of the poll questions was about, um, you know, are you familiar with the the accessibility devices, uh, the accessibility options uh, within your devices, and um, and and that's that certainly has helped. You know, you can buy an iPhone, you can buy a, a smartphone, and um, by simply going into into the settings of the phone, most modern phones have an accessibility section. They'll turn on a screen reader to read menu items. They'll turn, they'll make the fonts larger. Um, they'll make the um, They'll do reverse colors for folks who um, have a visual impairment with um, with color blindness. So you know, the, but the tools should never be the barrier. But oftentimes, when it comes to the classroom, the tools that we use are the barrier for not just students, but for our communities as well. And we're going to talk about both of these things. We're going to not just talk about how we make content accessible for the classroom for kids, but it's also important to remember that it's our communities who are also consuming that content as well, and that we need to make sure that we make that content accessible for them um, uh, in addition to that. So we never, we never want tools to be the barrier. So what is accessibility? So this gets at the heart of our, our newbie question. What is accessibility? So at its heart, you know, if you look up the word accessibility, it's equal or equivalent access by a person with a disability. So that, the, there's two words in there that are really important. It's equal or equivalent. So technology is, is only accessible when it can be used effectively by people with or without a disability. If, if, if a piece of technology is created that, uh, or, or a piece of digital content is created that you have to have a certain skill set, meaning you have to have, you have to be vision impaired, you have to have, you have to have vision and you have to have hearing in order to access it. Well, you're leaving out a large chunk of people um, perhaps who who don't have that ability, who can't consume that content. So the the technology that we use, the digital content that we create, be it uh, be it an app or be it uh, be it a program that we use on our computer, or just simply the the items we put on our school website or our blogs. If the if there those if there's not certain measures taken to make sure that that content can be accessed by someone, uh, whether they have a disability or they don't, then that technology isn't accessible. What's important to remember is that that doesn't mean that someone who has a disability is going to uh, complete a task in the same way uh, that someone who doesn't have that disability is going to do it. So, for example, um, with a website, um, if somebody's filling out a form on a website, you know, you're filling out, so I just, I was filling out a form today because I was having to buy some plane tickets. Um, I can quickly zip through that form. Um, I can, I can use the, uh, I can use my mouse and point to the fields where I want to type, and then I can type on the keyboard, and, and I can clearly see what the form says. If someone has a visual impairment or they have a motor disability that prevents them from using a mouse or even a keyboard, 
uh, that form has to have certain functions in order for someone to be able to to utilize that form. They're not, they may not complete the form in the same way that I do, but there has to be something built in. There has to be uh, there there has to be measures taken so that someone uh, who who perhaps can't use the mouse or who can't see the form can still access that content in order to in order in order to use it. So it's important to remember that with accessibility. Someone may not complete a task in the same way as someone else because of that disability. So we have to be very mindful of not only the content that we create in our classroom, but the content that we that we create for our communities. That they're not the 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 folks who access those contents in different ways may not be doing it the same. Now, accessibility means something different for for different types of people. We know there are lots of disabilities. Um, and there are, there, are, there are lots of categories of disabilities, especially in the United States. Um, I'm going to show you some facts and figures here in just a second. But it, it, mean, it means something different for everybody. Um, I saw in the chat as we were, as we were starting, somebody um, was talking about how um, they needed to turn up the, the text size on their phone because of their aging eyes. That ability to turn up the font size is that's that's a that's an that's an ex, making the the phone accessible. If you have if you can't see some text that's very small, you uh, you need to use a device or change the font size in order to to make that content accessible to you. Think about it even simply if we if we remove um, electronic technology from the equation. Um, you know, I remember going to my grandmother's house and uh, when uh, when when she was alive and and as a kid, and I would. Uh, I would go and I would sit in her chair that she sat in all the time, and she had she read she, she was an avid reader of Harlequin novels all the way up until she was about 101, and she loved these books. And um, even as her vision started to go, she transitioned from using glasses to glasses that looked like the bottoms of Coke bottles to she had a, a magnifying glass that she would that she would hold, and then she had a magnifying glass that that um, like a jeweler's magnifying glass that, that attached to the side of her of her of her chair, so she would, didn't have, even have to hold it because she couldn't hold it any longer. Those are all types of of accessibility. It's making the content that we're trying to consume. It's it's the task that we're trying to complete, making it so that uh, so that we can so that we can complete that task. Now, when it comes to electronic text and when it comes to electronic accessibility, there are lots of different uh, different ways. Some that are easier to accomplish than others. Um, that that we have to take into account when we're creating content, the ability to make text uh, larger. Just, so just like in our example uh, that we that we talked about, um, believe it or not, colors. So um, you know, there's there's uh, I, I, on smartphones and on computers, you, you can change the uh, the colors. Um, I don't know if anybody if anybody has an iPhone or has a um, has a Mac that they use, um, but there were there were the, the iPhone just simp uh, just recently came out with. Um, the ability to where it will change actually the the warm colors on the phone after a certain part of the day, um, so that it makes it easier to see. That's a type of accessibility. Even though we we all may be taking advantage of it, it's a type of accessibility. It makes it easier for us to to see that. But color contrasting is a big one to uh, to make sure that we take into account uh, font sizes or the actual font that we use uh, is important to remember. Um, and then going further. Um, using uh, using adaptive technologies like screen readers, um, closed captioning. Uh, it was it's so wonderful to me. I, I can't tell you how many webinars I do, um, you know, on a weekly and a daily basis where um, there's the need for closed captioning and it's not there. And to see that that the, that this webinar has that available and you have somebody live captioning is really really incredible because there's not there's not a lot of that available. But we have to be mindful of that. We want to make sure that whoever is participating in the session and whoever is consuming the content can access it in an equivalent way. Remember, it's not it may not be equal, but it's going to be at least in an equivalent way. Now, in the so this is in in the U.S. So we we talk I'm talking specifically in the U.S. Why does all this matter? So there are there are federal laws related to to accessibility. So most most Americans are familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there are state laws that um, that require accessibility. Um, you know, when it comes to those two things, we're we're mostly um, familiar. I think everybody's probably familiar with um, physical locations and the types of accessibilities that they have to make. So, if you 
Um, if you build a restaurant, then you have to, and then it has stairs, you have to provide a way for someone in a wheelchair to be able to, to get into the restaurant where they don't have to use the stairs. Or um, if you've ever been to a hotel, now the, you're starting to see at the pools that hotels provide, you're starting to see chairs that lower into the water so that someone who may have had a physical disability that would have prevented them from getting in the water can still enjoy that, uh, enjoy that pool. So we're, a lot of people are familiar with the rules around um, the Americans with Disabilities Act or other laws that they may have locally, but um, you know it, it it goes beyond that. That it's it's a matter of fairness. It's a matter of making sure that we're being fair. Um, you know, when it comes to school, when it comes to schools and districts, um, schools and districts are also governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, especially when it comes to their electronic media. Um, and you know, if if there's a if in the U.S. if you um, are in a school system that um, provides any kind of content online, you have a not only a duty because it's fair, but a, a duty because by law that that content has to be made uh, has to be made accessible to um, to anyone. So um, and, and just in the U.S., I, I wish I had pulled numbers worldwide. I've tried to find numbers worldwide. It's very hard to do, but. Um, in the in the U.S., according to the last census, 57 million Americans self-identified with having some sort of disability. Um, 31 million of those as a as a mobility disability, um, which is the most common type. Um, but 16 million have a sensory disability involving sight or hearing. So it's it's a matter of we're trying to reach the widest audience. And and we you know most of the times when we think about uh, and when we think about uh, disabilities in schools, we're thinking about special ed, or we're thinking about students who need very particular accommodations. But it could it, it goes beyond that. It's it's providing accommodations for even for for every kid, or for every parent who uh, who consumes that content, or for every community member who's consuming that content. That there is more likely than not, there's someone in your classroom, in your community, who needs this type of accommodation in order to in order to have that equivalent access to that content. So again, we we're we're in the U.S. We're governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. In Canada, it's, it's I forget the initials in Canada that it comes, it's, but it's a very very similar. Um, in in other in other countries, they also have uh, they also have rules that govern uh, disabilities and the way that that folks um, have to comply with those laws. Um, worldwide, we have these standards called the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Standards, and it started out with it's called WCAG. We call it WCAG for short. Um, it started out with WCAG 1.0, and we're we're moving into um, the requirement for WCAG 3.0, 2.0, and 3.0. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of these here in a second, but they're they're standards and governance that uh, that digital content creators have to follow when they put their content online and make it publicly available. Now, these are these are um, guidelines to follow. They are strongly encouraged, and, and again, I, inf I encourage you to check with your uh, with your district and, and and ask them how they're working towards uh, making sure that the web content is WCAG 2.0 uh, or WCAG uh, 3.0. But um, it, it's good to understand what these guidelines are, uh, so that so that when you're designing content, when you're creating, when you're taking that PDF and putting it on your website, or you're putting that PDF and you're sending it out to all the Chromebooks in the classroom, or you're using that application. Um, on your iPads or your um, or your Android tablets, it's important to remember that those should have been designed with, with these WCAG standards in mind. Now, what WCAG 2.0 looks like, it looks at four areas, and so we're going to look at it from kind of a high level, and then we'll look at it from a, a little bit deeper level, but it really looks at these four areas. It looks at content, um, is the content robust, understandable, and understandable, operable, and perceivable? And so what those what those areas mean, so robust, so the content must be uh, robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide uh, variety of users, including those using assistive technologies, um, or understandable, um, that the information and the operation of the user interface must be understandable. So there has to be some, um, there has to be some intuitiveness to what's happening. Um, operable, that the user interface compo components and navigation must be operable, that if you put a button there, the button has to do something in its simplest form. Um, perceivable, information and the user interface components must be presented to users in a way that they can perceive. And so this takes disabilities into an account. Now, if we go a little bit deeper, and um, I don't know if you have the ability to make this large. I think this is in the, the live finder, too. But 
this goes in if you look at the WCAG, if you if you if you actually go into I I provided one of the resources around WCAG. If you actually look at it, it, it can be very, very um hard to understand. But really this this graphic kind of um breaks this down uh into those four areas and kind of looks at it from kind of these sub areas. So one of the one of the areas perceivable talks about text alternatives where uh you're providing a way for text to be manipulated or changed, made the font made larger, the font made smaller, what have you. Um, one is about time-based media, so anything that's time-based, so that would be a video, that would be a rotating banner or a ga or photo gallery, that there has to be, um, like on a photo gallery, there has to be a button that allows a user to pause that photo gallery so that they can, uh, so that they can see that content. Um, for videos, videos must have, uh, must have captions. Um, and we'll talk more about what some of these mean and some of the common things in the classroom here in a minute. Um, looking at operable, there has to be enough time for someone to do things. Um, there has to be, uh, you have, you, you can't um, set a timer on a page and, and have the, you know, set a timer for, to fill out a form that doesn't give the user enough time to fill out the form. Um, you know, understandable. Uh, understandable comes into the language that's used, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about some of that, especially in education. We have a lot of this edu jargon. We have to be very careful with the the language that we use. So there's a lot that goes into WCAG, but I'm going to try and break this down so that it's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so that you can, th there are some really simple things that you can do in your classroom when you're creating digital content, both for your students and your communities, to make it much more easily accessible. Um, to, um, to to your to your parents, and I see there's uh, some conversation that is that's happening about the removing content rather than making it accessible, and that's that's the sad state of affairs that we're in. Um, that we, that there are there are some that would rather not go through the trouble of making things accessible because they feel like the audience isn't large enough, then rather than uh, then go through the process of making it accessible, they're going to pull it all offline. Uh, offline. Which I think is, which is sad, and, and I don't, I don't want, again, accessibility isn't sexy. I mean, we, that's what we started out saying. This is very, very important for us to understand because, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be hard. This doesn't have to be something complex that we take on in the classroom. And you may be thinking, well, I have to worry about all the other 14,000 things that I have to do in the classroom. Believe me, I understand. I was a classroom teacher. I was a, I was a person who, who had, who dealt with those same sorts of things. And, uh, and so it's, in, it's the, but this is not something that has to be a burden on you. It's just these are things to keep in mind and to um, take into consideration as you're creating that content. Now, how are, how do individuals with disabilities use, uh, what, what types of adaptive technologies they use? Now, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with screen readers. If you want to try out a screen reader, um, if you have a smartphone, you can, you can go into the accessibility section of your smartphone and turn it on. Um, there are also free screen readers you can download from the internet and they will actually read the screen to you. Um, and we'll talk about why it's important to create content um, so that a screen reader can, uh, can use it. Um, one that's a little bit less common is a refreshable braille display. So this is, I wish I'd put a picture in here. So this is a device that sits actually below the keyboard. Uh, that actually has Braille um, as the screen is being read. Um, it actually has Braille that will show up for someone who um, who needs that accommodation. Screen magnifiers. I think I think many of us have used screen magnifiers before. They're built into pretty much every modern operating system. Um, On-screen keyboards or other special keyboards. There's lots of different types of of um, assistive technologies to keep in mind um, as we're creating content. But there's three areas of focus now, and and again, I'm, I'm I know I'm saying I'm having to preface a lot of this, but um, there's there's a I, I know that many of you may be in a position where you're not a decision maker or where you don't have much control over the programs or the devices that are used in your classroom, um, and that's fine. We can we we can operate in the limits that you're given, um, but it's important to remember with um, with any either hardware or software there's there's three things and three areas of focus when we're considering um, accessible digital content so if we're if we're thinking about let's think about it in a simple form we're thinking about a video we're thinking about we're create we're going to create a video and we're going to put it online because we uh, because we love to use video in our classroom well we have to think about a couple things one we have to think about the platform that we're going to use and we're going to talk about YouTube and the automatic closed caption the automatic closed captioning here in a second we have to think about the platform we're going to use to in order to host that video when we put it online 
Um, we have to think about the design of that video. Are we going to be able to create a video that's, that's well enough so that if somebody does have to watch that using closed captioning, are they going to have that equivalent level of, of understanding as someone who does not have that visual impairment? Um, that's an important thing to remember that, you know, a lot of times we create videos and we rely a lot on the uh, what's what's happening in the surroundings or what's happening um, that someone may not be able to see uh, and uh, and that's important to remember a great example of this is if you've ever listened to uh, podcasts or, or anything like that where somebody's just you know somebody says uh, you know is talking to someone that you can't see um, or you can't perceive what's happening in the area I like to listen to a lot of um, uh, stand-up comedy a lot when I fly and uh, a lot of times something happens in the audience when they're recording that, and I don't know, I, 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 I don't get the joke because I can't see what they're laughing at. I can't see what they're talking about. It's that consideration of design that's important. And then that goes along with the content that goes, uh, that is user generated in there as well. So it's these, these three, uh, these three areas are important to remember. And, and this is important to remember with hardware too, or the, the applications that you use. So like your school district website, or if you create a, a web page for your student, you go out and you use a Google site or a Weebly or you create a blog or something like that, it's important to know, well, how does that platform address accessibility? How does the design of that program address accessibility? And then how are you, when you create the content, when it goes in, how does it um, address accessibility? So what are the features of accessible digital content? And, and there's, there's, there's a couple things to keep in mind as you're creating content. We'll talk about the caveats of those. Uh, we'll talk about um, and how to overcome some of those. So one of the easiest and simplest ones that you can do is um, is alt text. So if you're creating content, so you upload an image. Let's say you have a classroom blog, and you uh, you know your blog that you um, that you want to, your your students to be able to contribute to, or you have uh, blogs that are created by students. Um, you they use a lot of images, or they put those images up. It's important to um, make sure that the images that are uploaded have alt text on them. And what alt text is, is allows someone who's using adaptive technology, assistive technology like a screen reader, who can't see that image, when the screen reader gets to that image, the screen reader will actually look for the alt text um, behind the page in what we call the HTML, and will actually read out what the descriptor of that image is. So it's important to have good alt text on your image. It's, one, it's important to have alt text to begin with, but two, it's important to have good alt text. So if, if you know, using my image here, if I had just said, you know, headshot, or I just said Stephen, um, that, may or, that may not be a good enough description of what that image of if I'd said Stephen W. Anderson headshot, um, who blogs at web20classroom.org, whatever. You know, the more information you can give, and think about it, you know, if you think about it, when you put up an image and you put in alt text, close your eyes or have someone who hasn't seen the image close their eyes um, and you read the alt text to them to see if they can, uh, to see if they can understand what that image is of. It's important to make sure that you're putting alt text on all images, any image that you put online, um, on your website, on your blog, and that, that you use in content. And then it's also important to make sure that, um, you know, any of the, so like even here in Illuminate, if I, um, hover over the buttons. Um, if you if you take any of these buttons and you hover over them, you'll get a little yellow box. So like if I hover over the little hand above the uh, participants, that little hand says raise hand. That's alt text. That's a tool tip. Those are, that, that's what makes this program accessible because I can hover over this if I don't know what it does. For for those of us who you know who haven't used the technology, it's great because you know I, I you know what does this what does this button do? Well, I can hold I can hold my mouse over and I can see what it does. But that also is a part of the of the program being accessible, so that the, when someone who's using a, assistive technology can actually know what that button does without actually being able to see what that button does. The other thing is about tables. Um, it's always best to avoid tables in web content because um, it, the every part of that table, every cell, every header, every row has to have a label. Because if you put a if you put a table up on to a to a web page of content and the screen reader comes to that content, then um, the the user needs to know what's in um, what's in each of those cells on that table. Um, and where this gets really, uh, really, really um, tricky and, and where it gets really bad is 
you know, for a long time. So I worked in a district. I taught teachers how to organize content on their web pages. Um, I told them to just, say, hey, you want to evenly space objects on your website? Put it in a table, but then just hide all the grid lines on the table. Um, that's about the worst thing you can do because the screen reader, as it comes to that table, will see that it's a table. And if there's no direction on how that, what, what's in those cells or what the content is in those cells, then it, it, throw, it completely throws off the person who's having to use the screen reader because they don't know um, what's going on with that table. So it's always best to avoid tables, but then just remember if you have to use one, make sure you have headers and labels on all the cells. The other one is making sure that the applications you use are keyboard navigable. And this is important to remember when you're using something like a, a laptop, a Chromebook. Um, you know, it's important that a user can navigate that entire page or that content without the use of a mouse. Um, as we saw, there were, you know, 57 million Americans just in the U.S. having a disability, 31 million of those as a mobility disability. Now, not all of those is a fine motor ability like a uh, disability like um, where they lose, someone loses the ability to uh, move the mouse. But think about our example in the beginning with the, the self-leveling spoon. Um, that's, that's an accommodation and, and someone who doesn't have who, who doesn't have the fine motor skills to be able to uh, manipulate a mouse in a way that makes um, that equivalent access, they, they can use a keyboard because they could use an electronic keyboard on their screen. Um, if they have if they they have a disability that prevents the use of their hands, um, there there are other tools they can use to manipulate a keyboard. But that keyboard has to be the the content has to be able to be manipulated through the use of a keyboard. So you're going to want to remember. Um, and the best way to test this is if you have content, if you have a page in your classroom, let's say your school district website, your blog, um, uh, anything that you have, if you go to that website and just start ha tapping the tab key, uh, you should be able to navigate through that entire site without e the use of a mouse by just using the tab key, um, using the arrow keys to move around, using the backspace key, which I, I know is one that's bitten a lot of people as they're filling out things. They hit the backspace key and it kind of goes backwards. That's all part of accessibility. Um, so the, a great way to, 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 to test all this on the, the applications and the sites that, that you use or your website that you're, where you're presenting this content, um, the best way to do it is just start tapping the tab key um, to make sure that the, the, uh, the technology is uh, keyboard accessible. So um, what breaks accessibility? And these are the kinds of things that are, are really what, what, what we really need to talk about because these are kind of the afterthoughts. Um, these are the things that, um, that most people don't understand what they have to do in order to make sure they maintain accessibility. Um, but they're also, the, I think, the easiest to fix. Um, one is fonts. So believe it or not, there are particular fonts that, uh, that are, are accessible and the fonts that aren't. And, you know, I, I, I love working with teachers and I love the creativity that, that teachers have. But if you go onto, you know, someone's website and they're using a very whimsical font because it matches the design of their page, the problem may be that that font may not be able to be read by a screen reader. So we need to be using serif or sans serif fonts. Things like Arial, Trebuchet, Georgia, Times New Roman. These are all fonts that have, um, that have equidistant spacing between the letters and, uh, and doesn't cause the screen reader to, um, error out when it comes to, uh, when it comes to those types of fonts. Um, Comic Sans is not accessible. Um, it's, t it's listed as accessible because it is technically considered a sans serif font. Um, but there are, there, the spacing between the letters on Comic Sans is not consistent and, uh, and can be, and can throw a screen reader off. So I know that, you know, when I go in and I talk to teachers about this, and I, especially my elementary teachers, because they, you know, the Comic Sans, it's very, it's very childish. It's very, um, it's, it's great for younger kids. Um, it, it, it is, one, it's hard, sometimes it's hard to read for those who don't even need assistive technologies. Um, but two, it, it will cause some screen readers to, to error out. Garmin is another one. I, and I was guilty of this. I used Garmin on my website and my blog for the longest time until I learned that it, the spacing is not equidistant. So, you know, fancy fonts are great. You know, as, as, as Paula said, you know, uh, fancy fonts, you know, I hate when I open something with fancy fonts. Um, you know, they're, they're great. You know, they, they serve their purpose. And, uh, but especially when you're trying to make something that's really hard to read, uh, are real, uh, you make something that's very hard to read, um, but beyond that, when you want to make sure that, you know, when you put something up on your website or you put something up on your, your LMS or you put something up on your, 
you know, on your classroom blog or what have you, you want to make sure that it can be read by uh, by anyone. So sticking to things like Ariel and Trebuchet and Georgia and Times New Roman, I know those aren't whimsical. I know they're not fun, but they do help make uh, the content more accessible. Another one's PDFs, and PDFs are the 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 uh, are the hardest thing to, to wrap your mind around about accessibility. You know, PDFs, a lot of districts rely on PDFs. And and I, I think a lot of people rely on PDFs because they are they're they're interoperable between devices. So I can read a PDF just as easy as I can read it on my smartphone, just as easy I can eat it on a read well, I'm not going to eat a PDF, I'm going to read a PDF on my tablet. Um, the problem is PDFs themselves are not accessible. Um, because of the way that the PDF is created, uh, when a screen reader comes over it, um, there it has to be made accessible. So the alt text has to be added, the headers have to be uh, have to be formatted for the the screen reader. The um, the uh, uh, it, it has to be made accessible so that so that the screen reader can read it. Um, there there are, there are ways to make these PDFs accessible. Um, if you have full versions of Adobe Acrobat, you can make a PDF accessible. Um, or if you use uh, Microsoft Word, and now there's a function in the newest versions of Word when you go to when you go to save that file as, and it's very easy to uh, to do that to create a PDF that way. They have now the ability when you create the PDF to make it accessible. It takes just a few more minutes to make it accessible, but by doing that one extra step, you are saving yourself hours and hours of headache. There are other programs too. I'm sure you know anybody else um, can put anything in the chat, anything that they found when they've created PDFs. I'm going to give you a much easier way um, outside of PDFs to kind of get around that um, here in just a minute. But if you have to use a PDF, make sure that you make it accessible um, to um, so that it can be read by a screen reader. Um, the the biggest one that I run into that is the one that is is the pre I think the easiest to fix are videos. Videos have to include closed captioning, and depending on where you are, it must even include a printed script to go along with it. So this includes videos that are created by teachers or students or uh, anywhere else in the school or the district. Think about it. You're going to create a video that then, just like in our situation here, I, if I was visually impaired, I should just as I should just as easily be able to use and and participate in this webinar. Um, that uh, that that's where closed captioning is so important. That's why it was so great to see it. Um, but you you should be able to use closed captioning. So if you use a service like YouTube or Vimeo, make sure that you uh, that you turn on the closed captioning. Now I know that closed captioning is not always great. So if you are creating content and putting it into into YouTube, you have the option to do auto closed captioning. Make sure that you read it. Make sure that it you take the time to um, to do it. Um, if you're pulling a video from there and posting on your website, you have to include the closed captioning on that. Or if you pull that video and you use it in your classroom, you have to provide the closed captioning for that. So making sure that you're using videos that have closed captioning available on them is is really, really important. Um, yeah, you can, and you can edit those those captions. So if you use the automatic captioning feature in YouTube, you can. it's very easy to go in and edit. It'll go time by time, timestamp by timestamp. It's very easy to go in and do it. Vimeo is the same way. You can, uh, you can edit those closed captions. So this is, I know this is really hard. I know some of this is you're thinking, you're sitting back thinking, well, this I, I'm just I'm gonna do what you know what Wes was talking about earlier. I'm just gonna pull my stuff all offline and I'm gonna put it behind the username and password and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. That's that's the wrong attitude to have. Um, it, it's it's we 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 should all be advocates of accessibility because there are some really just easy easy things that we can do to make content more accessible, not just for students but for our communities as well. That are are just so easy to use. They're not going to take you any additional time. PDFs. If you can avoid using a PDF, um, that uh, that you can. If you're going to if you're going to if you have to use a PDF, make it accessible. If you can avoid using the PDF, it's better to post that content directly into the the platform, like the website or the LMS. If you can get away with doing that, do it. 
because then you're going to use this the the system that's in place. You be, it'll ma automatically make it keyboard navigable. It'll automatically um, you know make it so that it's screen reader accessible. That uh, if you can avoid the use of PDFs, avoid the use of PDFs and just post your content directly to um, the web platform that you're going to use. Um, closed captioning's easy. Just make sure you have them on. Make if you're going to use if you if you're you know some people are all about flip classrooms and they're you know they go out and they find some great video to teach some content. Awesome. Just make sure you the, that it has closed captioning available on it. Just make sure that you can um, that that the someone can can hit that CC button just like how they can here and uh, and 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 use the the closed captioning feature. That's where YouTube is really great for this. Again, the closed captioning there they're not going to come out 100% every time, and especially if you have students who talk fast or they um, or they. Um, you know they they don't they're they're far away from the microphone or or something like that um, that 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 can that can mess up closed captioning so making sure that uh, just make sure that you read through those closed captionings and uh, and if you can provide the script even better um, making sure you choose your fonts carefully so the the other thing too is avoid scrolling or flashing text. Because um, you don't want to, somebody who might be prone to seizures could be set off by having flashing text on the page. Um, and plus, screen readers can't read scrolling or flashing text, so it's always best to avoid those um, as well. Um, and then remember earlier we talked about language. Um, part of accessibility, too, is making sure that there's standardized language. So um, if you can avoid using abbreviations, idioms, or jargons, which I know is hard in education because we have an abbreviation for just about everything. Um, uh, if you can, if you have to, if you have to use an abbreviation, then it makes sure you at least spell out what that abbreviation is every time you use it, so that someone who's uh, using a screen reader or using a, another assistive technology understands what that analogy or that abbreviation is. Uh, but the the simpler that you can make the language on that, the you know avoiding those uh, those types of things, um, the better off you are. And then the last thing is just being an advocate. Being an advocate for uh, for accessibility and, and it's it's asking the right questions. So if you uh, if you have the ability to purchase a device or you have a you know you're a decision maker or something like that, um, that um, you know it, making sure that the devices have assistive technologies built in, um, or if you can purchase apps or you know purchase software or you can you know decide to use a particular website feature, making sure that. Um, it has uh, accessibility built into it as a as a, a a part of it. Making being an advocate for this is really what's going to help push a lot of and drive a lot of this forward. Um, that um, that you know making accessible content does not have to be hard. Uh, it does not have to be uh, difficult. Um, if it's something that hasn't been thought of or hasn't been you know uh, in the mindset for a long time, it can be it can be pretty daunting because it can be a, an arduous task to think about how am I going to convert all these PDFs? How am I going to convert all these videos? But at least having the mindset of saying in the you know going forward, hey, you know we need to make sure we have this available so that our students can can use these tools or so that our community can use these tools. Um, being that advocate is uh, is really important. Um, and so I know that Pe I think Peggy or someone um, someone with the classroom uh, 20 team has has done a wonderful job of taking um, the resources that we talked about here. I'm sure there have been tons that have been shared in there. I've seen some links fly by. Um, I'm sure there have been some of those there uh, as well. Uh, make sure make sure that you you know you you have as much information as possible. There are tons of of great resources. That digital accessibility toolkit. Um, is a really good one. Uh, is a really good one to to take uh, to take away. That tips for creating accessible course content. It's written for the the. It's written for college content in mind, but there's some great ideas in there for just if you're putting your content online as part of your classroom. Some things to think about. Um, and that WCAG two how to meet WCAG 2.0. That's the one that looks a little daunting, but gives you great examples of what each of the areas in WCAG 2.0 uh, really mean. So. Uh, we've got about you know five or four or five six minutes left. Um, do we want to do some questions? Yes, Stephen, I did capture some questions. You answered the one about the transcripts for videos, I think. Um, Oh, 
comment? Do you have a comment on the recent Republican initiatives in the U.S. decreasing accessibility? <laughs> um, I. <laughs> I think it's important for all of us to remember that regardless of what happens at the uh, the state or local level in terms of the rules or you know even the funding around accessibility, as educators, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that the content that we produce and and that students consume and our communities consume is available and accessible to everyone. So um, you know, sure, the law, laws change all the time, rules change mm -hmm. all the time. But there, it's it's really more a matter of humanity, making sure that um, whoever's going to be accessing our content can do it in an equitable way, uh, and so that's I'll, that's where I'll leave that one. <laughs> okay. If you make a Word document accessible and then convert it to a Google Doc, is that accessibility gone? Um. If you make a Word document accessible and then upload it into Google Docs, you'd have mm -hmm. to re you'd have to look at how Google Docs handles accessibility. I haven't looked too deeply at Google Docs. I know they are keyboard navigable, they're screen reader accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you'd have to look at the uh, making sure that you could add um, alt text to any images. Um, mm -hmm. So so making sure that you know just just making sure that you don't lose any of those functionalities is always best. Okay. So far, we've talked about the educator. What responsibility do we have to ensure that students make content accessible in, say, a video assignment that they contribute to discussion? Yeah, I think it's. The, I think it's. The, these are good conversations to have with kids too. I think it's the same things, and I don't think with kids it has to be any more uh, any more challenging than than what we have to do as content creators, as as teachers, and making sure that hey, if a student creates a video, making sure. And making sure they create a script to go along with it. Now think about it too. Think about it as part of the activity of creating the video. If they create the script that they're going to use when they create the video, and and you you want to have the script anyway, you can load that script into the Google and into the into the YouTube closed captioning, um, and you've got the script already readily available. Plus, you can use it as um, as a part of the activity um, you know that they're that they're doing when they create the video. So. You can build it into what students are doing, but it's good to have that conversation about why this is important. Um, but then, uh, it, it's, I think it's something that could easily be done when, especially videos, when students are creating videos, just include, hey, you got to have a script along with it because we're going to load in the closed captioning um, for that when we put the video on on the web. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this Seeing AI iOS app by Microsoft for its potential to help with accessibility? Um, I, 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 that's, that one's new to me. I would have to, I'd have to take a look. Um, uh, I know there are, there are, there are a lot of apps that are available for, for mobile devices now that help with accessibility. Um, that's where um, Google and Microsoft and, and, and Apple have been, um, they've been good about trying to make their devices themselves accessible. I would have mm -hmm. to look at that one to, to really see, uh, to really see what's possible. Okay. Uh, this question was at the very beginning when we were just talking about types of disability. Would you consider fear of failure a disability? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, I suppose it could be. It wouldn't technically be covered under the uh, any of the rules or laws right. governing accessibility, but sure, yeah, I mean that that could, you know, the the fear of creating content and then uh, the, I run into I run into this a lot with especially educators that mm -hmm. they there's that fear of well I know I need to do this but I'm going to do it in the wrong way so I'm just not going right. to do it at all um, that that sure. certainly can hold us back but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be anything anything challenging. Okay. Those were the questions I captured that were not answered during the pre your presentation, Stephen. Does anyone else have a question for Stephen that they'd like to put in the chat? Go ahead, Tammy. Um, not so much a question, but just maybe four to six weeks ago, uh, I came across some posts about several colleges that are being sued right now 
because they, their courses are not accessible. So there's even potentially a legal side of it. It's not just a matter of, yeah, there's, there's laws, but it could fo be followed by being sued. So it's something we have to think about, keep our schools out of trouble. Yeah, def and it's, we're, we're actually seeing that trickle down into the K-12 space, too. There have been many, many, many districts who have gotten a very, very scary letter from the U.S. Department of Education about their district websites um, not being in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And if you don't do anything to fix it, they'll pull your federal funding. Um, and so I've spent a lot of times in a, in a lot of districts talking to them about their websites, about this very thing, about accessibility. And so um, every part of the website, whether you're a, you know, it's your main district website or your, it's your classroom, all of it has to be made accessible. So it's important for all of us um, in education to understand. And in addition to the humanity and the equity of it all, there, you're right, there's a, there's a legal part of it as well. And I've got another question here. Any links or resources for video best practice, that is, recording and confidentiality, best backgrounds, et cetera? Um, there's, I think there's, as part of the, um, the those accessibility guidelines, the toolkit, mm -hmm. there's some of that in there as well. Um, just there's some, there's some really good things if you look for, um, if you look for um, um, some video, if you look for resources around creating videos for flipped classrooms, I know John Bergman um, has created some great stuff on, uh, on how to create great videos for the classroom, especially um, in kind of the flip sense about some of that, about backgrounds and things like that. Those are some good things to look at as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks for having me, everybody. And I will turn the show over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was just so valuable. And it's, it's really great to have not only someone sort of raise the awareness for us, but to give us some really practical suggestions and resources for where we can go learn more and become even more aware and share this with our students and teachers. So thanks very much for doing this for us. Um, we have some a couple more great shows coming up in December before we all take our winter break. And I hope you'll come back and join us if you can. Next week, Shannon Miller, the amazing librarian extraordinaire. She's so good at everything, but she's going to talk to us about Buncey and Edubuncey and all of the amazing things you can do with that. And then on December 16th, we're going to go out with a bang with Carly Moore and Sean Fahey doing an entire show all about Flipgrid. And we've all been following it and learning about it and, and beginning to use it. And we couldn't have two more experienced people joining us to share their passion and also their tips about how to use Flipgrid with your students and teachers. And then we'll be taking our break from December 23rd through January 6th. And on January 13th, we're going to have a big celebration. That will be our ninth annual anniversary. And we are so excited about that. And we hope you'll come. It'll be party-like, but we'll also be doing some learning and sharing. And I'm sure there'll be some prizes. So plan on joining us. And thank you all for being with us today. Thanks, Peggy. Good morning. Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD re resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a collaborate session. As, and as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site or fill out the form inside the live binder. Uh, you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collection from iTunes U. As you exit the session, the survey link should open in your browser, or you can take the link from the chat box or from within the live binder itself. And at the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate, thanks to Patty Ruffing for sending these out and having them print out your name on their certificate as well. Please make sure a 
personal email address is the one you use to request this. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Stephen Anderson, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>